Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean Egan. I'm the director of COVID workplace safety here in the state of Michigan. And uh, I'm uh, very thankful that you're joining us today for our uh, continued Q&A sessions that we try to do. This one is covering the MIOSHA emergency rules that were issued on October 14th. A lot of good information to get to today. I'm going to talk probably a little bit longer. We do try to have longer Q&A sections, but today, because there's so much information to cover, we're going to do our best. I would anticipate that we will run over that three o'clock deadline and we'll try to hang on for some time after that if we need to. Uh, we certainly will not get to all the questions that we've already received. So keep checking our website and other things that I'll reference and we'll definitely try to continue this dialogue that we've been having all along in this COVID crisis. Uh, I can tell you uh, that here in the Department of Labor, we have been working very hard with workers and businesses to really get open and stay open as we fight to contain COVID in our communities. And as we've seen, we're having some challenges uh, currently to do that. Um, all of the noise that we hear around COVID every day, it's a new virus, Corona, you know, it's, we're learning about it, new research is coming out, but a few things have remained absolutely the same since the beginning of this crisis. And that is the need for social distancing, good hygiene, and face coverings when we can't maintain that social distance. And when we think about the rules I'm gonna discuss, as well as the DHHS orders we're gonna discuss a little bit, um, keep those things in mind. Social distance, good hygiene, face coverings when we can't do that. What we know is that about 40% of the spread of the virus seems to be coming from folks that are asymptomatic, meaning they'll never get sick. So if we're not lucky enough to capture them in a test for some reason, they're going to be out in our community circling around doing what people do and uh, they're going to be able to transmit that virus. Another significant percentage comes from people that are pre-symptomatic, meaning they feel fine at the time. And those face coverings that are required in so many places are critical because they can cut transmission by as much as 70 percent, but only if we're both wearing them. Uh, it's important that we pull that virus back close to us. And one thing that is so critical to understand is that my face covering protects you from me. It does not protect me from you. So we both have to be wearing these things to make sure that we're really lowering that trans chance of transmission that you see on this chart here. And we know that when we had the stay home, stay safe order and our numbers really dropped off fast, that's because that's the ultimate form of social distancing. And if we're both wearing those face coverings and keeping that social distance, we can really cut down the transmission of COVID. And we still keep it quite low when we're both just wearing face coverings. But any place where you're going to be high density, can't maintain that social distance, everybody needs to be wearing those face coverings. And there's still a chance of transmission if we start packing in too much, which is why we have these spacing requirements and some of these other tools that you're working through right now. One thing that we have to keep in mind as we push into winter and we're seeing it in our numbers and I know we all feel it is that we have to get used to that. Nothing is going to be normal. We're gonna be fighting COVID for the next uh, several months, if not longer, and we're gonna to have to keep adjusting and keep reinforcing and taking personal responsibility for our obligation to protect our communities and keep others safe. And that includes staying out of work, uh, if you're sick, making sure you're not out mingling around without face coverings. Doing these things is not a choice. These are requirements to make sure that we are not spreading COVID in our communities. And we've seen our numbers explode here in the Midwest and across the country as we continue to try to re-engage. And the only way we keep that going is by making sure we're all doing our part to keep our numbers as low as possible. Now, throughout this crisis, DHHS has been monitoring workplace outbreaks, and I look at these numbers all of the time. I take out some of those places where they might capture a lot of patients or students or others. Those certainly do have employees in there, but to make sure that we're focusing on numbers where we can tie it more directly to employees getting sick, these are kind of some of the things that we're seeing. We're tracking 26 outbreaks in the manufacturing and construction. And just last week, there are another 14. 10 in offices, another eight. Seven in restaurants and bars, another five. Six in ag and food processing, another three. And then retail and personal services, we're tracking three. And there's another four from last week. So we're seeing all of these things continue to, to climb up there. Now, certainly when our numbers are going up, like we are in Michigan with 123 cases, per million, 
putting us in that high category of uh, community spread, it's more likely that COVID is going to come into these places, which make these rules and things we're trying to do all that much more critical. And our positivity rate as Michigan as a whole is at 5.1% and certain regions are well above that number, which means it's spreading in our communities really, really strong and really fast. And we all have to be that much more diligent as we continue to try to re-engage. So as we move into these emergency rules and epidemic orders, keep in mind those concepts of social distance, hygiene, face coverings to help contain the spread of COVID. For uh, by and large, when we created these emergency rules, we were looking for consistency between what had been previously uh, told as guidelines or guidance or enforced and what these rules require, recognizing that these rules will be in place for the next six months, potentially longer. We don't anticipate significant changes to them, so it's a good opportunity to get used to them. Certainly, we'll continue to monitor COVID, monitor COVID and kind of keep that going forward. And, and with that, you also are very aware that DHHS has issued epidemic orders, which may overlap in some ways with workplace safety, but in many cases apply to individuals and other venues as well. So you want to pay attention to those. And I know it's a lot to look at. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that when we work through the rules, if you're an employer or an employee, focusing on that workplace around workplace safety, get those plans together. And then separately take those DHHS orders and start to understand what pieces apply to your place of business or your workplace. And then you can look at other things that you do in your communities like volunteering, football games and those other things because you're not going to find those pieces in the emergency rules. These emergency rules are really geared around workplace safety. So first and foremost, in the rules, you're going to have to create a plan, which I'll mention next. And part of that plan is to establish an exposure de determination. This was also included in the executive orders. Uh, and what that does is it allows you to understand what types of mitigation strategies you're going to take in your workplace based on your workers. Most of the discussion today is going to talk about the lower and medium risk workplaces because those are the vast majority of workplaces. When we talk about high or very high exposure risk workplaces, those are places where uh, aerosols are being generated, where known or suspected cases of COVID are, and where people are being treated. So think more like medical mortuaries. Uh, dental offices can become high exposure risk because some of the work that they do creates aerosols, so they want to be aware of that. Most workplaces are going to fall in that medium and lower exposure risk. And those are workplaces that don't have known or suspected cases kind of coming in and out and all around. Certainly, we're going to talk about health screening and how you try to keep that hazard right out of the workplace altogether. That determination will be part of your preparedness and response plan. This plan and the template is available on our Michigan.gov COVID workplace safety website for low and medium risk workplaces. We'll cover engineering controls, administrative controls, hygiene and environmental surface uh, cleaning and other tools, personal protective equipment, health surveillance and training that you need to do as well as some record keeping components. It has overall rules for all workplaces and then it has some specific rules that are in addition to for certain types of workplaces that you'll want to make sure you're aware of. Most of these things that you're going to be doing for COVID would fall under administrative controls. Those are things that you can implement as management that employees must follow. Engineering controls are those things that don't require uh, personal behaviors for those to work. Among these will be establishing workplace procedures and you need to have a workplace COVID-19 coordinator. This is, does not need to be a manager. It can be any employee. They're going to be on, on site all the time to make sure that all of these pieces of your plan are being implemented and followed. Among those are including mandating face coverings as required in the rules. And this is a spot we've been getting a lot of questions on because the emergency rules in some cases look different than the DHHS orders. And I'll talk about those differences a little bit, but in general, in all workplaces across the state of Michigan, the employer must provide non-medical grade face coverings to their employees at no cost to the employee. You must require the wearing of face coverings when employees cannot maintain that six feet of separation, and then consider face shields if they're within three feet of each other uh, often. 
And then you must require face coverings and shared spaces, including in-person meetings, restrooms, hallways, uh, those types of places where people might congregate. Because uh, throughout all of this, with our numbers in Michigan, congregation is bad, separation is good. So you really wanna focus in on, on that piece. And then we do have some specific requirements for employees and customers for certain types of industries in the rules, which include retail, restaurants, some health care, personal care service, public accommodation, sports and exercise facilities and casinos, very similar to what was required under the executive orders. And then lastly, you're gonna have employee health screening procedures, absolutely critical. One of the best tools that you can do is try to keep that hazard right out of the workplace. And we wanna flag people that have symptoms of COVID so that they're not potentially exposing the remainder of those employees, which could cause further disruptions to your workplace. Uh, there are many ways to do this, and I'll mention one later that's free. Uh, it's a, a app that you can use and it's wonderful. That plan will also include your cleaning procedures. You, you're gonna have to be routinely cleaning. And if you have a sick or suspected or confirmed case of COVID, you're gonna need some enhanced cleaning to make sure that you're really getting the potential spread of that virus out of the workplace. Because as I mentioned with hygiene, we do know that this virus can survive on surfaces and we can contaminate ourselves by touching that surface and then touching our eyes, nose or mouth. Make sure that you understand what you're going to do for sick employees. They need to, uh, needs to include how they report that to you and uh, what you're going to do to isolate them as well. Your plan will have training components that includes any procedures or policies, including those health screening procedures, any teleworking, administrative controls, other things that you're going to be trying to do. Make sure that it includes how COVID-19 spreads. Uh, we have great resources available on a site that I'm going to mention in just a moment that can help you do these things, but make sure that you are doing this and documenting it. As I mentioned, there are a lot of industry specific requirements included for all of these locations and these guidelines are all updated to be in compliance with the emergency rules. They're available and I would encourage you to use them. When you are looking through the rules, I would just remind you to try to not get format shock. When you move from the executive orders that you could look at that were very prescriptive uh, to the emergency rules, rules just look different. So these guidelines are a great resource to really help you visualize and see more succinctly what's required for all industries as well as your industry. And in each one of those industry specific requirements, the requirements for all industries are included and then those additional pieces are tagged on there as well to make sure that you can find it all in one spot. So one thing that when you're doing that plan, focus in on the rules, get it lined out, understand what you need to do for your workplace, and then uh, look to the epidemic orders as well because DHHS is really working to focus in on how they can stop the spread through congregation or other tools to make sure that uh, we can minimize or mitigate the spread of COVID in our communities. And that's where you're gonna find those things that you were used to on indoor gathering limits, seating limits, attendance limits, those types of things for different types of venues. This does apply in the workplace as well. So if you are a non-residential venue, you're a workplace, you're gonna to need to look at your meetings and trainings to make sure that you are in compliance with these capacity limits within those workplaces. Now, it doesn't necessarily apply to the production floor or anything else, but where you're having a gathering, a specific gathering, such as a training or something like that, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to these. And the goal there is not to thwart business for sure, it's to ensure that uh, we are trying to minimize congregating among people because even if we're wearing those face coverings and everybody has them, if we're getting too close together, those face coverings are only about 70% effective. So we still heighten the risk or probability that that virus will escape in enough capacity to start infecting people around us. And with our infection rate so high and our cases so high, we pretty much have to assume that all of us are carrying this virus in order for us to do what we can to make sure we mitigate the spread. Again, that's where a lot of the capacity limits are for uh, very similar to what was in the executive order, including the uh, casinos, public facilities, recreational sports. And it does include 
mask requirements, which some of these are very much stronger than those in the emergency rules. And that includes in any kind of retail, public space, anywhere people are coming in and out, they're going to have to wear masks, both employees and uh, customers. Food service establishments still have the 50% of normal seating, keeping the table six feet apart, closing those indoor congregation common areas, uh, and, and you know following those kind of pieces there. So you definitely want to make sure that you uh, go through those rules and then understand what parts of the epidemic orders apply to your type of facility and things that you may need to do there. Now for the MIOSHA rules themselves, and we do have links over to the DHHS data, all of this information is available on our site at michigan.gov COVID workplace safety. As I mentioned, uh, the comms team in MIOSHA did a great job of getting everything updated the same day that the rules were released to mirror the rules. So all of these guidelines are updated. They're available, they're very user-friendly and easy to use. We still have great posters. Uh, some videos are being updated. We have great fact sheets and other tools there for you to make sure that you can implement these things. And, and as I mentioned, we do have that template exposure control plan there already for low and medium risk workplaces that you can use if you don't already have one of those. You do not have to follow that template. If you have one that covers all these components, you're fine. Uh, but if you need one, uh, feel free to grab that and use it. MIOSHA has a hotline. They've set it up months ago, early on in COVID. It's a wonderful tool that's specifically for COVID-related workplace safety and health questions. It's available for employers and employees. If uh, you're an employer and you call in and they can't answer that question for you, they can get you over to the consultation team. If you're an employee and they can't help you or you need to file a complaint, they'll get you over to the complaint side of the MIOSHA process. The wait time on this, these calls has been about 10 to 20 seconds throughout this crisis. You heard me right, 10 to 20 seconds. So make sure you're taking advantage of this tool that gets you directly into the MIOSHA experts. No question is too small, no problem is too big. So make sure that you use this hotline as much as you can uh, while you're fighting through with all of us to contain COVID and keep those workplaces safe and healthy for our employees and customers coming in and out. We also launched an ambassador program several weeks ago now. This is a proactive consultation, not based on enforcement or penalties. We have folks that will just pop into a workplace and offer that one-on-one -on -one guidance uh, around these emergency rules. They have a checklist they work with. If you don't have time for a full consultation, you can schedule a follow-up uh, that they'll come back and do. They have a list of businesses. We're focused more on those that are open to the public to make sure the right protocols and things are in place there. Uh, and it, they're out and about and making that happen. It's a wonderful tool. We also have a consultation program separate from this within MIOSHA, and you can request a consultation. Then they will do either on phone or on site consultations with you to help you understand and implement a lot of these things. The toolkit is available on that same website if you just want to see what the ambassadors are using so you can get a good sense of what these consultants are giving uh, advice on and just make sure you take advantage of that as well. We have links to a lot of other great information there, including uh, this long string of letters, which is the Michigan Economic Development Corporation Peer Michigan Business Connect platform that will connect you to Michigan manufacturers that are making face coverings, hand sanitizer, plastic barriers, you name it, it's probably there. If you manufacture those things, you can uh, also get on that list by connecting through that uh, link there. But if you need that stuff, I am told that our manufacturers in Michigan have capacity. So check that out if you need it. And then as I mentioned, the My Symptoms app was created by DHHS and the University of Michigan. It's an app that employers can use. You set up an employer account, you get a code, you give the code to your employees and they will get that questionnaire right on their smartphone, tablet, you name it. It'll flag if they have symptoms. There's a report for the employer uh, and there's if you don't want to look at the report, the employee can just show you their smartphone and they get a green if there are no symptoms. They get an orange if they have symptoms and should remain out of the workplace. 
So I know I went really fast. Uh, we were trying to cover a lot of information today and leave some time for questions. Uh, we'll continue to do this outreach and updates on the, uh, the rules as we move forward, as well as other information that becomes available. We do have our final uh, in the series of HVAC webinars this Thursday from 2.30 to 3.30 as well. So make sure you sign up on our LEO website if you'd like more uh, information and communication from us. All right, and with that, we'll jump into the questions. Sean, the first one we have is from Robin. She asks, when do we report COVID-19 positive employees on the Form 300? So the Form 300 is an annual logs that you need to maintain and have available uh, with MyOSHA or Federal OSHA if you looked it up just generically, but uh, and uh, report it according to their instructions, but it's annual. All right, and the, another one here from Roy. If an employee's spouse was exposed to someone with COVID-19 for less than five minutes, can the employee come to work? Neither of them have symptoms, and if they can't come back to work, how long or what is the procedure for the employee to return to work? Um, so uh, I would assume that that came in through a local public health that uh, somebody they knew was a confirmed case. They should follow the direction of that local public health department on how they should quarantine or isolate. Under our rules, that would not necessarily meet the definition of a close contact and you would just kind of continue forward. All right, and a question here from Christy who asks, if an employee tests positive for COVID-19, when and how do we inform the customers that the employee may have been around? Uh, employers are required to notify local public health who will help with that contact tracing piece. Uh, under the DHHS order, there are certain types of venues that have to keep names of customers so that they can help with contact tracing. Uh, we do not have those contact tracing pieces in our rules, but you'll definitely want to check the DHHS order and local public health will help you with that. Employers are obligated to notify any other employees or contractors that they may have had working for them of that were in that area uh, to kind of start isolating within their workplace. All right, and if an employee comes to work with a fever and is sent home, can we have them get a COVID test before returning to work? Uh, yes, some employers are working with their employees to require a COVID test to actually identify. I would encourage them to work with their medical provider. It's possible that the uh, you know, some folks uh, will have conditions or something that their doctor has been working with them on. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, there are many testing facilities to try to identify and make confirm those diagnoses. All right. And our next question is from Catherine, who asks, are masks required indoors if you are more than six feet from other individuals? It depends on the indoor location. So for retail, restaurants, bars, personal care services and others, absolutely. If it's a, sort of a closed off workplace, uh, thinking uh, an office that does not have a lobby or any access to the general public within those types of workspaces, if you can maintain the six feet of social distance, uh, you should be able to work without that face covering. But if you're in those common areas, hallways, in-person meetings, you're gonna need it back on. All right, and if an employee tests positive for COVID-19, does the whole garage where that employee work have to be quarantined? So it's gonna depend on whether or not those were actually close contacts. Certainly we're seeing this in workplaces where, um, you know, if, if you are working, if you're within that six feet of that person for 15 minutes or more, and keep in mind that's a cumulative over a 24 hour period, uh, according to the latest CDC guidance, uh, you may need to isolate or quarantine it. Just being in the same building does not necessarily mean that you would need to. All right. And are we required to make employees work from home if they have the capabilities? Current work situation is spaced out and safe. So part of the rules does include, and we've gotten this question a lot, that employers must prohibit in-person work to the extent feasible. And what that means is that employers do need to make a determination if uh, both based on economics, you know, a, a number of factors on what employees need to be in the workplace. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, congregation is bad, separation is good. It, uh, we do not expect employers to invest in a $100 million 
a you know remote farm a database farm or anything like that so that they can pull this off but if it's legitimately possible we would encourage employers to do that and create that policy to prohibit in-person work all right our next question is from allison if company policy is to follow cdc guidelines of requiring employees to quarantine for 14 days following direct contact with someone who has confirmed covid are the employees liable to pay the are the employers liable to pay the employee for that period? Certain uh, certain. So under a federal law, which is administered by the US Department of Labor, not the state of Michigan, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act does provide for up to 80 hours of paid leave under those conditions for certain uh, workplaces. You have to be less than 500 employees total. Uh, and then if you're smaller than a certain number, there's a way that you can opt out. And then certain medical providers and first responder employees could opt out of that as well. So it depends. Now, if you don't qualify for that because of the governor's work to expand unemployment, uh, you can qualify for unemployment benefits. All right, and our next question is from David. In the gathering prohibition and face covering order from MDHHS dated 10 9 20, a gathering is defined as two or more from more than one household in a shared space. How is a shared space defined? Uh, for example, if I close the door to my private office, it clearly is not a shared space, but if my open door leads into another work area, is it now part of a shared space? No, in that situation, just opening the door would not become a shared space, but that hallway outside of that door could be uh, considered a shared space. What they're, what we're looking at there, where uh, even in your office, if somebody else were to come in there because you're having a meeting, that just became a shared space. Um, it's where two or more people are coming together in a common area, whether intentionally or they're you know just kind of bumping into each other. So if you all run to the vending machine at the same time, the vending machine is going to be a shared space. But no, to that question, just having the door open would make that private office a shared space. Great, and, and you touched on part of this next question, um, but someone else is looking for details on defining that shared space um, in terms of mask requirements. So hallways, restrooms, in-person meetings, you know, can they use a conference room for meetings without a mask if they're seated six feet apart? No. Okay, and then restrooms and these hallways uh, then would be considered a shared space as well? Yes. Okay, all right, and our next question asks, is providing the preparedness plan via email adequate? Yes, it needs to be available upon request to employees or uh, if they have a union rep to their union rep, um, and you can do that on an intranet, you can do that via email, you know, whatever's, whatever's practical. All right, and Tanya is asking, when dealing with a COVID positive person, what is considered close contact with and without a mask? So the CDC guidance and our rules do not distinguish between uh, with or without a mask. It's within six feet for 15 minutes or more, uh, and that 15 minutes is cumulative. All right. The reason for that is that the mat face coverings are only about 70% effective. So that's not 100%. So that's why there's not a distinction. Perfect. And Alan has a question here. Is there a physical log required for the daily entry self-screening protocol for all employees or contractors entering the workplace? Uh, you will need to have those records. So some employers might want to do a physical log. Some might have it electronically. If you use the My Symptoms app I mentioned, that that's sufficient. You can download that data at any time uh, when you may need it. All right, and this one's from Valerie. Please explain how to conduct a feasibility analysis for remote work. Does the rule mean almost no one can report to work? No, not at all. We expect the employer to make a determination on who needs to be in and who needs to be out of the workplace. My OSHA is not going to get uh, into the weeds on why, you know, person X is over there. Uh, they're only going to look for cases of gross abuse of that. So if uh, you're in an office with 100 people and all 100 people are showing up, it might be feasible, it might not be feasible for all those 100 people to work remotely, but they're going to they're ask you why they're all there. 
Now, when you do that feasibility analysis, it can be based on uh, the work of that person. It can be based on the inability for them to log in remotely. It can be a, a number of factors, but uh, uh, there's going to be deference given to the employer to make a good faith judgment on who needs to be in and who does not need to be in the workplace. All right, and if an employee is sick and says they do not have COVID-19, uh, they have no fever, no known exposure uh, to anybody who has tested positive, presumably it's just a minor cold, and if they want to work, uh, should we tell them to stay home? Did you say they have a fever? No fever. Okay, so I think what we need to do in those cases is really look at those symptoms of COVID. As we know, fever is not always a symptom, but it's, it's you know, it's routinely a symptom. Um, if they're having that runny nose, the cough, those other pieces, uh, certainly without being a confirmed negative or a confirmed positive by getting tested, I think that we have to treat some of those illnesses as if they are COVID. We recognize going into fall and we're pushing flu shots. Make sure you get your flu shots, everybody, uh, because that's going to look a lot like COVID. Um, colds and allergies are going to look a lot like COVID. So we know there are challenges moving forward as we head into the season where we all get sick anyway um, that we're going to have to deal with. But we should be deferring to that might be COVID uh, when, when we have the chance. All right, I know we're running over on time, so I'm going to make this the last question, Sean, and then I'll let you close us out. Are MIOSHA, MDHHS, and the CDC the same in their COVID recommendations? And if not, what recommendations do we use? So the MIOSHA rules are going to be in place. You have to follow those rules. The DHHS epidemic order is in place and they have the authority to issue those, so you have to follow those rules. And then CDC is mentioned in both the MIOSHA rules and the DHHS rules and spots to recognize that the CDC is going to continue to update their language. So um, you, for workplace safety, you, you have to follow those MIOSHA rules. And then, uh, as I mentioned, that does reference some CDC language to recognize some of those changing components. Uh, so that would, that's the gist. And with that having been the last question, Erica's quiet now because she's probably expecting me to wrap up. So um, I really appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. These are very important questions. This is very important work. Uh, as I mentioned, there is no normal. There is no moving right back to normal. We have to fight through COVID. These numbers are going up. The cases are going up. It's going to be more likely it's in our workplace. So we need to be more prepared than ever. We have to be more stringent about those health screenings. We have to make sure that we're taking responsibility, recognizing that workplace outbreaks are outbreaks, but they're happening all over. They're happening at your, well, not backyard barbecue anymore, but you're having everybody over to your house to carve pumpkins. There's a potential spread of COVID. So it's going to be a hard holiday season for all of us. I think we're all going to have to uh, kind of accept that our goal and finish line is to move beyond COVID to hopefully make 2021 a much better year than 2020 has been, as we all know. Uh, and keep fighting this COVID virus because uh, we just, you know, it's it's just going to stay with us for some time until we get to a good vaccine, until we get a lot of people vaccinated, or we all work really hard to get those numbers so low that uh, we can kind of start moving forward a little bit better. So I appreciate you taking this time. We're going to continue to do this follow up. Make sure you ask questions. We appreciate them. Uh, we'll continue to answer those as much as we can and, you know, keep helping me help you and help all of us contain COVID in Michigan. And I really appreciate it.